Okay, um, we might get started. So, hi, my name's Emma McLean and I'm the Scholarly Communications Manager at UNSW Sydney and I have the pleasure of chairing this session today. Before we get going, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land that I'm on today. Uh, for me at UNSW Kensington, that's the medical people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to encourage you to all think about whose land you're on today. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders both past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. Okay, so today we've got a great uh, presentation beyond open access, what should our aims be for full accessibility? We will be, um, our, our presenter today, today is the Associate Professor Alice Motions. She's a chemist, Alice Motions, sorry. She's a chemist and science communicator based at the University of Sydney. Her research focuses on open source drug discovery and science communication, outreach, participation and education. Finding ways to connect people with science and to make research more accessible is the overarching theme of Alison's interdisciplinary research group. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now and hand over to Alice. Thanks so much, Emma, um, for the lovely introduction. And thanks so much, everybody, for joining today. It's great to be with you during Open Access Week 2020. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm joining you from today. For me today, it's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'm on campus at the University of Sydney. Um, and I acknowledge that Aboriginal people have been sharing knowledge and caring for country for at least 60,000 years. And I acknowledge that this, this land um, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. It's a real pleasure um, to, be, to be joining everyone today and I'm really looking forward as much to talking to you as, as, as the discussion at the end, which I think will be really enriching. Um, Emma and the team um, who have been organising asked me to speak about Beyond Open Access and it feels um, uh, a real privilege to talk about this topic, but also important to acknowledge that uh, we're not quite yet at the beyond open access stage of our uh, journey, I don't think. Um, so I'm very much aware of that and I hope that that will be clear in my talk. Um, but I thought I'd start um, today by um, casting back our memories to um, something that happened just about a month before I joined um, the team here at the University of Sydney, um, back in London um, at the 2012 Olympics. Oh, they're away and Gatling got away brilliantly and he's ahead of the field at the moment and uh, Bolt going very near, here comes Usain Bolt, Usain Bolt storming through, he takes it again, Blake gets the silver, 9.64, oh, he's returned his title in the most emphatic way, brilliant, 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 Usain Bolt of Jamaica, fastest man on the planet 9.63 a superb demonstration of power sprinting what a performance that was Gatlin attacked early but Bolt got into his running really it was an unbelievable run and Blake I think got the silver he did and Gatlin got the bronze but Jamaica won so um, some of you might remember watching this race if you're a fan of athletics. Um, I think the 100 meter race is often uh, an, uh, an event that happens in sport, you know, um, at the Olympics every four years, although we're, we're sad to have missed um, Tokyo 2020 this year, um, that really captures people's attention. And what struck me about this race, which was one of the most exciting that I've seen, was that it's clear and as the commentator was saying that that um, uh, we have an emphatic winner here in Usain Bolt but 
he wasn't at the begin. He wasn't ahead at the start of this race. Uh, Gatlin was ahead. In fact, until the fifty meter point, he was behind the the people who finished in second and third place. But he was able to see what his competitors were doing. He was able to look to his left. He was able to look to his right. Um, and even in the shortest of races, he was able to know what his competitors were doing and the right moment to accelerate in his research. Um, not his research, his running. See, my analogies come too quickly. He, he was able to accelerate. We see that athletes um, performing at the highest level, they don't run in tunnels. It wouldn't be much of a spectacle if these athletes weren't allowed to see uh, what their competitors were doing at the same time. Um, and I think this is an important analogy for research. Um, by increasing transparency, by being able to see what um, our collaborators, our competitors, the people that we learn from um, in our scholars, scholarly lives are up to, it can help to help us raise um, our game and help us to accelerate at the right moment and also lead to not just competition but increased collaboration. So um, just about a month um, after this race I moved to uh, the University of Sydney and I came to work with, so with then Associate Professor Matthew Todd, he's now Professor Matthew Todd and he's actually back in the UK now as the Chair of um, Drug Discovery at, at UCL and Matt Todd, who you can follow at this handle on Twitter, um, had recently then, back in 2010, 2011, had founded the Open Source Malaria Consortium. And this is what called me to Australia, was an opportunity as a research chemist to work as part of a project that would be radically open. Um, and the idea here was to share our research as openly as possible, possible uh, with the broadest community and to try uh, with this model to expedite um, the, the, you know, the, the key goal of the project, which was finding a new medicine for malaria and to do that more cheaply. Now, open source malaria is still very much up and running um, and it's been a really important part of my research career and also of forming um, some of the, the opinions that I have uh, about why it's important that we strive for not just open access, but ideas beyond this. So the key thing here is that this is a research project that is similar to any other medicinal research, medicinal chemistry research project across the, the world, in that the science is the same. It's just the sharing of the science that is different. And uh, Professor Matthew Todd proposed a, at the time and has written a commentary since uh, that you can reference at the bottom last year, um, six laws for open science, which I won't read out to you, um, but can be broadly summarized as the idea that everything should be shared um, and that there should be complete transparency in the project. So part of this as a scientist working on the project, and um, this was my notebook before I took my wife's name, um, I was formerly Alice Williamson, um, was to have all of our um, notebooks um, completely accessible um, and available on the internet. So to share the research as it's happening. And importantly, to share the data too. Um, and I have borrowed this analogy from Professor Peter Murray Rust at the University of Cambridge. Um, I've made it a little bit more vegetarian friendly. His analogy is between, um, I think, mints and hamburgers, if I remember correctly. But here um, we compare data to potatoes and chips. So maybe some of you are feeling a little bit hungry. I haven't had lunch yet, so um, I, I'm not trying to, 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 to make you disappear and, and grab something. But um, I think most of us would agree that chips are pretty great. Um, but potatoes offer so much more in terms of their um in terms of what you can do with a, with a with potatoes you can make chips from them you can also make massaman curry or stew or roast potatoes all sorts of dishes and this is an analogy that we we try to think of with data um, we're sometimes a little bit too obsessed with the chips the process data the finished data the complete data 
and we're not as good at sharing the raw data for others to use. And sometimes, you know, this means that people can also spend a lot of time um, trying to make their data uh, really comprehensible and really um, easy to read in this process form, which is a worthwhile task in, in, many, in many cases. But often the raw data would be more um, useful for other researchers in trying to um, emulate that research or to reproduce research or to really learn what's happened. Um, and indeed, in chemistry, you know, we, we do reactions um, and we, we unfortunately, when we react chemical A with chemical B, we don't always get chemical C. And often if we do get chemical C, we get it in a mixture with, with other side products too. And it would be good to be able to share some of that raw data rather than just the, the final um, chemical or the final information. So this is very chemistry specific, my example, but um, I think this is the case for all types of research, not just science, that where possible, it would be great if people could have access to this raw data. And one of the analogies that was used with open source malaria and this idea of open science or open research, please forgive me when I drift into using the term science, it's because of where I, I come from in my research, but um, we could use the term open research, is to compare this kind of transparency of being able to see into the lab or see into the lives of researchers as being um, as satisfying as having a, an, an open kitchen, an open restaurant. Um, I don't know about you, again, I'm focusing on food, which is probably not a good idea at lunchtime, but um, this idea of when you go for a meal and you can see into the kitchen, you can see how clean the kitchen is, you can see um, how, um, how much the chefs are concentrating, you can see that their, their clothing is clean, that they're not, you know, um, scratching their nose or you can see this transparency and you can see what's happening is something that I think we should um, strive for um, to a greater extent in our research um, and particularly in a scientific sense I think this this peek into what we do as researchers can um, actually try and help to uh, minimize some of the stereotypes of what a scientist or what a researcher looks like or what's happening within our research institutions. And of course, I think we owe this to our public um, because we are members of the public and much of our research is funded by um, the public and we have this, I think, a real responsibility to share what we're up to with, with members of the public. So this is probably an image that's quite familiar to, to people um, within this, um, this seminar. Some of the, the benefits of open access, and I think all of these uh, are really valid and open access is, is a very powerful and important um, thing for us to aim for as scholars and as people who are working in trying to, to make uh, data and information and knowledge more openly available. Um, but I think it, it's fair to say that even with really great strides towards open access, the publications that result from this, the papers that we st see, are still not that dissimilar from um, what's credited as, as the first uh, research paper or first research papers from 1665 and 1666. The way in which we share um, our research and share our data is still um, quite similar to some of those original papers and um, the way that we tell these stories in our research can sometimes still um, be hard to interpret for people who are not directly within the field um, or indeed um, we know that we, we privilege um, English as a publishing language and this has um, some serious ramifications for accessibility. So I think the main um, crux of, of what I'd really like to talk about today and something that we've been exploring in my own research group now that, um, that I lead at the University of Sydney in the School of Chemistry is that access does not um, automatically equal accessibility. And so in thinking about this talk, um, what I wanted to, to share or to discuss with, with you today was how we can strive towards 
um, achieving accessibility. So beyond this idea of access, what do we need to do to make research more accessible to people around the world? So in thinking about this, um, there, there's sort of been th three key themes that have influenced the way in which um, I've been thinking about my research and practice. Um, and one of them has been very strongly linked to transparency, increasing transparency of science, I think is, is part of um, an important step towards democratizing science and, and making uh, people truly feel connected to science as though it's a part of our shared culture rather than something that happens behind closed walls and the same for all types of research. But increasingly, I've been thinking a lot more about how, um, and this kind of links back to that idea of access does not equal accessibility, is that just because something is transparent or just because something is available doesn't necessarily mean that it's accessible. And I think the key here is in how we communicate the research beyond um, some of those kind of uh, traditional journal formats. And if we get this right, this combination of transparency and communication right, hopefully this will lead to um, science and research and knowledge and trust in knowledge having a central, uh, a more central and uh, more obvious role at the center of our culture. And hopefully that will empower people, uh, members of the public, people in power, politicians, to make decisions that are based on evidence and knowledge and to make those decisions in a way that we can understand them again feeding back into this idea of transparency and communication so one of the um the one of the central um themes that emerges in in, in lots of scholarly work that's linked to open access um, is the idea of of incorporating open access with open evaluation. And this is a paper from 2012, the same year as the um, 100 meter final that I, that I showed at the beginning um, by three authors um, based in the UK and Germany. And uh, one of, you know, this is from the, the introduction to their paper. I won't read out the whole quote, but they really, um, they really look at or critique a system in which we still um, restrict um, the access to some of the outputs of our scholarly work. Um, and we also um, have some secrecy in the peer review process, uh, which leads people to, um, to not really know what's happened along the way and really does lead to researchers privileging um, the, the place in which the research is published sometimes rather than the quality of the, the research. Now, open evaluation is something that I think is, has a really important uh, part to play in advancing um, ideas in open access. Um, but it also needs to be done really carefully because um, we know that there are power structures within society, within academia, um, within everywhere, um, that mean that some people um, may not feel, um, uh, for want of a better word, safe to, to, to openly evaluate uh, other, others' manuscripts. Um, and so this idea of changing the culture of research or the culture of how we share our research, which is a very um, uh, grand and important statement, I think is, is really important if we're going to be able to achieve both open access and open evaluation and to have transparency throughout the process. So we come back to the potatoes again. I think this is, is really important is thinking about how we can share raw data and how we can share data that can be interpreted by different systems and non-proprietary systems. So for example, if you use a certain instrument to measure a certain data set, how can you share that data in a way that it can be found by machines, but it can be read by non-proprietary programs? 
And um, as somebody who um, is building a research protein and um, that has some members, some students in our group uh, work in the laboratory and some students work on exploring science communication and science education and how we can improve these fields. Um, I'm increasingly becoming aware of the challenges in sharing raw data um, in social science research or humanities research or um, research in other fields. How can we find ways to, to share this data in, in, in ways that it becomes routine and also that it becomes easier for researchers to do this? There are lots of extra steps involved at present in sharing multiple files um, as well as the you know the final um, uh, the final kind of processed information and it would be great if there were systems in place that enabled some of our instruments to automatically send this data to electronic lab books or to send this um, or to or to enable us to anonymize this data in ways that it could be safe to share and equally importantly to have the instructions and the descriptions that come with this data that make it accessible. Moving um, on to communication, um, and there are lots of things I could have talked about in terms of transparency, but I really wanted to make sure we had time for discussion at the end of um, this presentation. Um, I think one of the major um, issues that, that's highlighted is still that much of the research that we see is uh, English is privileged as, as a language of research. It's a rare occasion as a chemist, as a scientist, that you find paper that you really need to read that's in a different language. Um, and that's a privilege that, that we, we have as people who can speak English. But it's also um, clearly the case that a lot of uh, research that's published in other languages um, may have been lost or may not have been used or people might not have been rightly attributed for doing seminal work in different areas. So thinking how we can communicate research um, in, uh, in, in both languages that enable different people to access them, but also in plain English or um, in language that's uh, where jargon is removed where it's unnecessary so that it can be understood better by colleagues in different fields is something that um, I think is really important. So back to the potatoes, the last time they'll appear. Um, I think this, you know, touched on this in the previous slide, this idea of communicating data. So, and this is back to this idea of access does not equal accessibility. So it's all well and good to present data or to share raw data. But how do we um, make sure that um, along with that data is an expl explanation of how to read this data or how to interpret this data or how to use this data? And how do we acknowledge that this also takes extra time and um, can be challenging for researchers to achieve this in every case um, when there are so many competing priorities as a researcher and there are so many different things going on? And of course, um, you know, we, we're, all um, we're all trying to do our best but it would be great to have systems in place or automated processes that enable this to happen. Um, the importance of communication and science and I'm really looking forward to catching up with Susie Wiles's talk. I couldn't catch it unfortunately yesterday and I know she's been doing some extraordinary work along with other colleagues in terms of communicating science in the middle of one of the most challenging times for communicating information about science and about research. In the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, the data, the information has been changing, the advice has been changing as um, it's been an extraordinary opportunity to communicate the process of science and the process of research and the way that we find information, but it's all been unraveling in the public and perhaps at a pace that's been um, maybe even too rapid for us to keep up with and we're all absolutely affected by this too so we're we're tuned into this situation so um how do we how do we work on communication to make sure that even when there is um correct or um genuine information that is trustworthy from trustworthy sources how do we work to ensure that this is the information that cut through cuts through 
Um, I don't know how many of you would have uh, known about hydroxychloroquine as non chemists um, before the COVID-19 pandemic, but I think um, most of us have heard of this medicine now. Um, and unfortunately, um, because of uh, different uh, influences and insignificant political figures, um, hydroxychloroquine that was originally developed for the treatment of malaria um, was uh, one of the medicines that had been examined for the treatment of COVID-19. Um, and before we had any evidence that it was effective at treating COVID-19, uh, a number of sources um, really announced this as, as a possible treatment without that evidence base. And we now know that um, we, it's been proven to, to not be effective in the treatment of COVID-19. But along the way, what we saw was um, increased prescriptions and increased sales of this medicine, um, leading to a shortage in this medicine, much like we saw in, in, in toilet paper at some times during this pandemic. Um, and this is you know, really particularly worrying for those patients who do need to take hydroxychloroquine um, for autoimmune conditions. So you can see that even when there is data there, it's a, it's a lot of work to try and challenge uh, misinformation and making the data accessible um, is, is only part of this story. So um, in terms of you know, science communication, this is something that increasingly, as I was a postdoc with um, Matthew Todd, on the open source malaria project and as I develop my own independent research group that I've increasingly been thinking of as being you know equally if not more important than this transparency in the data um, because um, being able to to talk about research to talk about uh, what's happening in our institutions and to translate this in ways that it's um, accessible to many I think is a really important part of this beyond open access story and one that I would really like to see increasingly and I know in this conference we've seen this um, um, increasingly to see this link between open access and science and research communication and fortunately uh, we're really lucky in Australia we have um, significant figures who communicate science really effectively there's been some wonderful uh, reporting in Australia and New Zealand um, through um, the ABC, uh, through, um, uh, through uh, public figures like Susie Wiles, the chief scientist in Australia and New Zealand, um, had teamed up with Susie and I think Michelle Dickinson and did some great work there. We've also seen um, great work from the ABC, um, almost daily podcasts from uh, Dr. Norman Swan and Tegan Jenkins. Um, and I think we've also got some great examples of people who communicate science in non-traditional settings, because we need to be aware of, despite great um, efforts to communicate science and research in plain English alongside those uh, journal publications, that not everybody reads about science in the news or reads um, uh, about research publications. So we rely on people who can translate this information into more uh, relatable or palatable ways. And in Australia, we have um, experts such as Sonia Pemberton, who's a wonderful filmmaker and is able to have very nuanced and personal and powerful discussions about areas of research or science that have differing opinions and to be able to tease out and to bring that human connection through. Um, it, we also have, and this is a graduate of Sydney University, Derek Muller, um, with his YouTube channel, Veritasium, an element of truth, which has over 5 million subscribers and does some you know, beautiful work. Um, and um, it's been great for those of you who don't follow um, Astro Kirsten, Kirsten Banks, um, Kirsten's been doing some phenomenal work in communicating uh, research, particularly in astronomy, um, using TikTok, which um, I'm, uh, I think I'm definitely too, too um, old for TikTok. I, I haven't been able to use this yet. I get, thankfully, I can follow Astro Kirsten because she retweets to Twitter. Um, but she's reaching a new audience with amazing and very powerful and funny uh, ways of communicating science and breaking this down 
into um, really entertaining uh, packets of information. And um, one of my colleagues here at Sydney Uni too, uh, Cory Tut, has Cory Tut has done some exceptional work in bringing science to classrooms, um, particularly in remote areas of Australia, um, through his program Deadly Science. So we do have people who are able to do this and to able and able to do this in a variety of ways, and I think that's really really important. Um, I've been increasingly um, interested in. Um, ways that we can bring research to the public um, and, and, and enhance this access to research by directly involving people in research. And one of these ways is through citizen science. Um, it's uh, really, this term has been coined, you know, since the mid 1990s. Um, I think it would be great if we could change some of the terms to, to citizen research or participatory research or community research because it doesn't just have to be in the areas of science. I have chosen an example from science here. Um, this is one of my favourite um, citizen science projects that's been particularly relevant to in the time of COVID-19. Uh, this is the Fold It um, challenge where members of the public are invited to play a game to fold proteins and there's been one particular challenge that's been running in this project which is run um, by a fantastic lab and a fantastic group of people where they've been challenging people to try and fold um, the, uh, the, the spike protein of the, of, of the COVID-19 virus so it's been very relevant and we had some students doing this at the University of Sydney um, and this is just one example of how you can actually um, centre uh, members of the public, um, other researchers who are from different areas within research and embed these ideas um, and really try to make this as accessible to people as possible. Um, now, of course, um, this, this um, does mean that um, you need to have access to um, a computer and access and time. To, to, to be involved in these projects. So we've not completely um, made this completely accessible for everyone, but some of these approaches in citizen science, I think are, are really important. That's something we've tried to um, within, uh, at the University of Sydney, within my group. So through the open source malaria project, we worked with undergraduate students to get them involved in making new medicines. Um, and out of that, I um, developed a project called Breaking Good, which is a bit of um, a play on the AMC series Breaking Bad, where Walter White uh, got together with his high school student or former high school student, um, in that case, to make illicit drugs to try and make money. We are breaking good. We're not trying to make any illicit substances. We're trying to make molecules that matter. Um, and one of the stories that emerged from this was when we recreated a price hiked medicine called Daraprim, um, which had been hiked uh, in price by five and a half thousand percent overnight in the US. And we were able to recreate this with a local high school um, very cheaply. Now, uh, one of the things we've been working on this program too is to increase the accessibility of this project. So to develop ways that we can work with um, school students across Australia who might not have access to the greatest uh, lab equipment, either by inviting them into the university or by providing kits. And this is something we're working on at the moment, thanks to some funding that we received from the Google Impact Challenge um, uh, a little while ago. Um, and this year, we haven't been able to do any work within laboratories um, for obvious reasons. We've not been able to visit schools. So we developed um, a more of a social science citizen science project where we've been asking people to explore the essential medicines and find out information about the pricing and availability of medicines around the world. So we've been trying to shift this away from a central science theme and to see how we can involve people in our research and make research more accessible um, in different uh, areas of study. So, um, I'm going to finish off in a second, but this was something that came through. I can't remember if I read this early this morning or late last night before I went to bed, but um, just in the middle of Open Access Week, um, we, we heard an announcement that there is an agreement for uh, an open access agreement between Nature Journals 
which comes with a, a rather hefty price tag of nine and a half thousand euros, which is just under 16,000 Australian dollars to um, publish openly in some of the most highly regarded uh, journals that, that we have. Um, undoubtedly, there was some great research in there. But when we think about these fees and when I consider these fees, I have to say, you know, I find that pretty um, borderline heartbreaking, to be honest, when you consider that 16,000 Australian dollars could um, pay for at least a couple of months, if not more, of a postdoc salary or a research assistant or could enable some students to undertake some research and scholarship. Um, and also to think that what we could do in terms of the science communication, what we could do in terms of the research communication, how we could use this funding to make some really engaging pieces of research communication that would translate what's happening in our universities and our institutions in ways and forms that connect with members of society. So I think, you know, uh, kind of comes back to the, the title at the beginning, we still really do need to do a lot more in terms of achieving full open access, but it's important that we look beyond this too. So I think that um, some of the challenges for us that we need to achieve are on increasing this transparency and pushing open access and, and developing new method, methods to, to share research and to make research um, accessible. And I think the key here is communication. And if we're able to combine this increased transparency with really effective communication of research, I think we will begin to see a difference, or I have to believe that we'll begin to see a difference in uh, the ways in which our leaders and members of the community feel empowered to make decisions that will be to the benefit of, of, of all of us and can be based truly on on the best and the most precise knowledge and data that we have at the time. Um, and I'm going to finish there. I've just put up a, a slide of some of the students and researchers who are in my research team at the University of Sydney. So on this slide we have, um, I'll start from the left, we've got um, soon to be Dr. Kimberly Scroggy. We have Ellie Downing who is a PhD candidate. Then we have uh, Olivia McRae, who's a PhD candidate, Hung Fat Duong, who's a PhD candidate, Genevieve Firma, who's a master's research student, um, Dr. Yela Golumbic, who is a postdoc in the group, and Sebastian Leach, who's just finishing up his honours, and my colleagues here, Dr. Rain Pullen, Dr. Kiara O'Reilly from Museum and Heritage Studies, and Professor Peter Rutledge within the school. And um, what we're trying to do in our group is to try and find ways that we can make our research of different types more accessible and to connect people with science um, by combining this idea of transparency and communication. Um, and I'll, I'll finish there. Thanks so much, Emma, for the invitation today. But I'd be really happy to answer any questions or try to answer any questions that anybody might have. Fantastic. Thank you, Alice. Um, I've just been monitoring the chat and a lot of people have been loving your analogies, even though it is lunchtime. Um, and I think um, the one that really struck me was the open kitchen idea um, and how, you know, often it's a very prestigious restaurant that has the, the most open kitchen and um, maybe linking the idea of um, quality and um, value to open um, and, and is, is something that needs to keep on happening. Um, we have, yeah, so if anyone wants to put any questions in the chat, that would be great. Um, I have one here um, to start off with about what does such outrageous article processing charges like nature's exclude from science and I think you did bring up a few of those. Um, sorry, sorry Emma, could you just say the, the top part of that question again? Um, who, who does such outrageous APCs like nature's exclude from science? I, I think almost, I think uh, almost everybody, you know, that kind of fee um, and it's a really challenging, it's a really challenging thing to discuss um, 
I've noticed this as somebody who has who started in this area as a postdoc um, and was really delighted to come and work with Matt and now as somebody who is supervising students and um, supervising postdocs or collaborating with postdocs and students because which is often what it's more like um, is that you have to think about you know their future too and where they need to publish and what they need for their careers it's no longer just about um, what you choose to do or what you want to do it's really about them too so balancing um, the really significant impact of a, of a major publication in a really highly regarded journal and undoubtedly some of the research there is you know absolutely phenomenal um, with what you you think we should do in terms of accessibility is it's really challenging and you know thinking about what's best for the people that you work with but that kind of fee um, I think it would only really be researchers with the very very um, highest amount of funding who would be able to contemplate that or researchers who are working very collaboratively anyway so where everyone contributes a much smaller amount towards you know the large fee if that makes sense um, and also I think that um, you know it's it's quite a worrying precedent particularly if I was trying to if we're trying to communicate that back if we're doing research that's been funded by um, government funding that's come from the taxpayer um, I don't know that I would be delighted to see that that's how um, my research was being that that's how my funding was being spent in order to make a paper that my tax is paid for open so yep. it, it, it's really I, I'm really quite uh, quite disheartened by this, to be honest, and quite worried about what that might mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we'd agree there. Um, okay, so got quite a few people thanking you for your presentation here. But another great question: Can you suggest how people should just start very simply with science communication if they've not done it before? Um, yeah, of course. Well, for one of the things that uh, I sometimes give a science communication talk and my top 10 tips for doing science communication are all to start doing some science communication, which I know sounds a bit of a gimmick, but I think often um, it's something that I really only started knowing I was doing when I moved to Australia. Um, and I think that sometimes we feel like we need you know a tap on the shoulder or someone's going to ask us to do something whereas we have to just start and it's not that i think that every researcher must be able to do this because we have different skills and we have different things that we're driven by but um my my tips would be to find the medium that you're most comfortable with so if you really like writing um you know stick with that if you really like talking i love radio and it's my favorite way of um absorbing information or uh, of losing myself so radio is my preferred medium I think I'd have to say and um, so to find the medium that you like and that you're comfortable with and to try and pitch your ideas to somewhere that you know will really be receptive to them so within institutions a good place to start with writing is to write something for the website or for the faculty that you work for and to just start somewhere where you know you'll be supported um, and that somebody will critique your work you know somebody will review it probably in the communications team and give you some tips um, so that would be my like my tip for starting but also to remember that you know i always say to students and colleagues who are thinking about it we have so many radio stations in australia um, and all of them, pretty much all of them broadcast for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you can provide some content that's interesting and pitch it in a way that's interesting to the audience, people are often delighted to have somebody on to share something that's really interesting. So if you're going to start um, doing interviews or media interviews, it's good to start with somebody that you have a good relationship with and to start, start with topics that you're really interested in and to build those connections, I think, um, before starting with somebody who might be a more of an advers adversarial interviewer, because that can be much more stressful and it requires much more preparation. Um, and, you know, you have to think about which topics you'd share. 
Um, but if people are interested too, um, I'm always really happy to talk to researchers who might want some um, advice or mentorship in science communication. It's something I'm really passionate about. Um, but um, I, I know that I'm learning more about how and how not to do it every day. It's not something that I think you become the finished product in. It's something you have to continually work on. Sorry, that was a very long answer, Emma. I hope that was okay. No, that's fantastic. Well, one more quick question before we might have to wind up. Um, what do you think the easiest way for people to try out making their kitchen more open, more transparent? So maybe with blogs to begin with. And I think this is a really good exercise in science or research communication and also for students to develop um, the way that they keep sort of diaries or logs of their research. So perhaps starting with a blog that um, outlines what's happening in your group, what's happening in your research space. Um, and something I'm really, really interested in, I don't know if others are too, and I've found really interesting in this COVID-19 time is, I don't think we talk enough about the process of research. Often what happens is we hear when people get a grant, you know, it's great news, so they've got some funding. And we hear when somebody has done something, like when there's a new discovery or there's a new piece of information or a new piece of data. And that's great and I, you know, I love that. But um, I want to know more about what happens in between these two time points. Like what are the trials and tribulations? What's gone wrong? Um, what's gone right? Where has the project changed? And I think that blogs can help to communicate what I think is the most important or as important or really interesting area of research, which is the process, the bit in between those two kind of bookends that we often only kind of privilege. Fantastic. I'll just see if there's any more quick questions, but I think um, most people are, Re referring through to the conversations we're having before about whether the nature deal is just signaling that will the ongoing exploitation of researchers in the um, in the publishing practice. Um, what do you think? Do you have any comments to that? Look, I think I think the system, and I don't, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not saying anything new here. I think this will be. It, I think this will be a commonality. Maybe I'm wrong, but between this audience, um, you know, I think there's very much a problem with a system where we we have to pay to share the work that we've done. Like it just it just um, doesn't make sense to me. And um, you know, going back to food or kitchens, you know, it feels very much like um, we don't. It, like we're going to a restaurant but with all of the ingredients and we have to cook our own meal and clean up after ourselves and then pay for the experience like it, it doesn't feel you know like that's the right way for research to be shared to me um, and I do wonder whether um, some of the models for you know there's a lot of work great work's been done on preprint servers I think that's that's really a big revolution and people have really um, embraced them in the main but I do wonder whether this idea of putting things out there and having peer review afterwards, different models of, of how we um, look at our work and maybe for journals to sort of maybe, I shouldn't be suggesting a newspaper or a magazine business model at this time when they're not doing so well, I know, but that maybe they could be the places that curate or bring together some of the most interesting research of the week or the month. Um, I wonder whether some of those models might be what happens um, going forward and whether some of these kind of incremental steps towards open access are really just um, publishers and others sort of dragging their heels um, before the inevitable happens and I think and I hope that open access and free open access is what's inevitable because I think I, I don't know that the research community and the public will tolerate it for too much longer. I think that's a, a good way to end. Thank you, Alice. Thanks, um, thank you for coming and talking to us today. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And I think everyone in the comments have too. I've got lots of thank yous here. Um, I just want to tell everyone, um, if you have any further questions, 
um, you can email or tweet it and um, we'll get them to Alice and um, keep that conversation going. Uh, we have some more sessions happening just after this one um, today on, I think it's on, um, sorry, I'm, copyright. I had a black, oh, copyright, yes. Um, if you want to join straight after this. Um, and we have uh, another two sessions. Um, so have a look at the AOSG website to get information on those. Oh, and they've just been popped in the chat. Thank you, Ginny. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Forward to talk to you.